I'm Dave Letourneau. I'm a pilot for Legacy Airlines. I'm a captain on the Airbus A321, and I am a pilot that came from another airline. I worked at an airline that was bought up by Legacy Airlines, and I've been here since August of uh, 99. Yes. And uh, pushing 29,000 hours now. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. That's great. This means I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, well, you're in, you're in good company. We're all we're all getting old, Dave. Well, th thank you for joining us today, first and foremost, Dave. Um, and I do appreciate you agreeing to uh, sit down with me today and talk a little bit about your experiences twenty years ago during nine eleven. Uh, what do you recall of those first moments when you first found out about what was happening in New York? Um, I was uh, in Orange County, John Wayne, on an overnight. Um, I'd flown in the day before on September 10th, and uh, the entire crew was um, going through screening at uh, John Wayne, and we were walking down towards the gate to do our return flight from John Wayne to DFW, and one of the flight attendants um, was walking alongside of me, and she said to me, I heard that an airplane hit the World Trade Center uh, just a little bit ago. How could something like that happen? And uh, kind of, you know, rattled my brain for a minute. And I said, well, about the only thing that I could think of is maybe if the weather was really bad and a uh, pilot got lost or disoriented and they were unable to establish where they were and they mistakenly ran into the building. And she stopped me and said, no, I hear it's a clear day out there. And I said, well, was it like a little Cessna or something? And she's like, no, I heard it was American Eagle. And I said, wow. I said, I don't know how that could happen. And uh, so we continued walking towards the gate. And then at John Wayne Airport, we had to go downstairs outside of the building down into our operations area. And there was a TV on in the operations uh area and it was tuned to a channel of uh, some newscasters uh, talking about this and in the background you could see one of the buildings burning and I remember thinking to myself like wow this is a real thing that flight attendant you know actually knew what she was talking about and so it kind of paused and looked at it and it, the newscasters didn't know much more than an airplane had been reported to have hit the World Trade Center it was on fire and while I was watching the TV, another airplane hit the Trade Center, and, and I didn't see that that's what had happened, but the newscasters saw it, and they said it immediately. It's like, oh, my God, it looks like another airplane has just hit the other Trade Center building. And uh, then they replayed it, and then you know it was in the background behind them, and so you couldn't see it very well. Um, but they replayed it again, and this time you, know, you could see that an airplane had actually hit it again. And so I'm like, wow, you know, something's going on. I don't really understand what's happening. Um, but yeah, something's definitely going on in New York. And uh, I believe that at that point, I proceeded out to the airplane and started to do my pre-flight duties. And uh, I, I can't remember back then how we got our clearances, if we got them over the A cars or if we had to call and get them from the controller directly. Um, and I was on the fleet. Uh, that the airplanes that were used to hit the Trade Center and the Pentagon. Um, I was on the 757 that day, and I went into the cockpit and ended up calling the controller one way or another, saying, you know, I can't get my clearance. And he says, yeah, he says, there's a ground stop for all departures. And, uh, you know, check back in a while, and we'll see what's happening. I said, any idea how long it's going to go on? And he says, I have no idea says maybe in an hour or two he says you can you know call me again and you can maybe get your clearance and so i remember talking to the captain a little bit like you know have you heard what's going on did you see the tv downstairs and he says yeah i saw he says this isn't going to be a normal day you know yeah i have a feeling you're right and then i probably checked back with the controller after 45 minutes to an hour like any updates and he says, no, he says, uh, he says, I've never seen anything like this before. He says, the radar scope is clear. Every airplane in the country is being told to land and no departures are being allowed. And right about then, a, uh, a Cherokee 
came on the radio and he was looking for his clearance to go up to Burbank. And so then I heard the controller tell him, it's like, no, he says, where there's a ground stop. Nobody's being allowed to depart. Have you heard what's happened? And uh, the Cherokee pilot responded, yeah, but I don't understand how that affects me. That's out in New York. Yeah, he says, nobody's being allowed to take off. He says, uh, I suggest you go back and shut down. <laughs> and I know that guy was frustrated because he didn't understand why it affected him out here on the West Coast. But we all eventually learned. Um so that, that was kind of how, you know, I learned of what was going on. And I just went back into ops and started watching the TV some more to learn more what I could. Um, probably by, this was um, pretty early in, in the morning. So I think that it happened about 845 in New York and it was 545 on the West Coast. I think we probably had a 7 a.m. departure planned. And by 1030, I was back on the hotel van going back to the hotel. And there were a couple of United pilots in the van with us as well. Maybe it may have been Southwest pilots. I can't remember. Doesn't matter. Um, but I remember talking to them a little bit about it. And they were, you know, obviously blown away as well. And I'm probably jumping around a little bit. We went back to our hotel and they allowed us to check back in. And, you know, the people at the front desk were, you know, like had these, you know, concerned looks on our face, like, are you guys going to be okay? And I remember later on in the day, a letter was slipped under our door in our hotel room from the manager of the hotel saying, if there's anything that we can do for you, you know, or our heartfelt sympathies go out to you and your company, because it was your airplanes that were used in this attack. And if there's anything we can do, you know, be sure to let us know. And... And it's like, wow, you know, this is, that's right. This is my company. I do remember talking to the pilot saying it was um, these particular flight numbers. And like, does that mean anything to you? You know, that these two flight numbers were used. Um, and that was when one of the pilots said to me, um, no, the flight numbers don't mean anything, but you know, it's 9-11, you know, 9 like the emergency call. And that was the first time that I had heard somebody use that term, 9-1-1. Like, oh, wow, I didn't even put that together in my head yet that it was, you know, an emergency phone number that you would call to report an emergency. And it's, today's date is 911. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it definitely was a shock for, for everyone in the country and around the world. And I think it just, it, it meant a lot more to all the pilots and flight attendants and crew members and, and employees of the airlines, especially those of the airlines that were directly affected. Um, and it, it took some time for that initial shock to kind of fade into what the reality of the situation was. I mean, as the country sat in front of their televisions, we all sat there. It, it just, trying to grasp at answers. How long did you end up at the hotel? I checked in the hotel originally on the 10th and we left on the 14th. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I was based in Dallas at the time I was living there in uh, the Fort Worth area. Um, and so I couldn't go home. Um, but I had been, uh, based in the Bay area earlier um, and with my, my former airline. And there were a lot of um, pilots and flight attendants that lived in the Los Angeles area that I was friends with, that they would commute up to the San Francisco Bay Area when I was working for my previous airline. We didn't have a base in LA with that airline. And so I called a couple of those friends and, uh, you know, one of them invited me. He says, I'll come and get you, you know, come stay at my place. And so I went down to his place and spent the night there. I, I think not the first night, but the second night, because we didn't know when we were going to go back to work. And I told him, I said, you know, when I get called to go back, you're going to have to drive me back. I said, no problem. Um, he says, I'm not doing anything either. You know, I'm one of our pilots and, and obviously I'm not going to be flying a trip right, right away. And so I went and spent some time with him and, um, you know, we were all just glued to the TV for the next, you know, 96 hours, really. Um, I remember though that first night watching the TV and, you know, there was footage of the airplanes actually hitting the building. And I remember saying to myself, this is absolutely unbleepingly unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to watch the footage is like, my God. And yeah, it was very 
unreal, surreal, what's the right word, um, to believe that that had happened. And, you know, it was sometime later, you know, that I was able to figure out what the end numbers of the aircraft were. And so then I went and looked at my logbook and it's like, wow, you know, the, the seven, six that hit the trade center, I had flown that airplane about six months before that had happened. And the, the one that hit the Pentagon, I'd flown it about 30 days before it happened. Wow. So, you know, it's like, man, this is really close to home for me personally. It's like, I just flew that plane the other day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can only imagine, uh, you know, what was going through your mind, even to the effect of, I mean, we're, we're all human and you kind of stop and think, man, that could have been me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, because I knew you and I were going to be doing this, you know, I, I looked at some of the stuff um, about the particular flights on Wikipedia today. And I had mistakenly thought it was another one of our captains that Muhammad Atta had approached in Boston. Um, it was one of our female first officers on the 7-6 at the time. And I got it mixed up with one of the people that's in LA now. Um, but I was reading about that, that he had approached her and said, are you going to be flying this airplane back out? And she said, no, I just brought it in. And then he turned around and, and left. Um, but I remember thinking, it's like, you know, that person is like, you know, I was one flight removed <laughs> from this happening. And for her, she's got to be like, wow. And then I also um, read about how some famous people were supposed to be on that flight that, you know, changed their plans at the last minute. The one that stuck out most to me was Mark Wahlberg. Oh, really? Yeah, he was supposed to be on flight 11 from Boston to L.A. And he had changed his plans at the last minute. This is according to Wikipedia is what I was reading. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny because uh, I I spoke with one of your Mustang Air uh, co-workers uh, yesterday. Um, and we have a, a wonderful interview with Hans that, that we just recorded. Um, and he had mentioned the very story off the air uh, about the female FO that actually – once the realization of what had happened hit her and the realization that that was the, in fact, the aircraft that she had brought in. And then weeks or days after the news came out, she found out that Mohammed Atta was in fact the passenger that was at the time she thought innocently asking her about, is it a good airplane? Are you flying it back out? And, you know, as we do every day with, with customers, sure. you know, they come some nervous customers before the flight still to this day, uh, will poke their head into the flight deck and say, Oh, I'm a nervous flyer. Is everything okay with the aircraft? Uh, you know, I just want to, you know, see the faces of the pilots that are in command. And it's, it's difficult for passengers uh, knowing that they're not in control. Unlike yeah. in a vehicle or in a... Oh, well, it's hard for me when I'm sitting in the back knowing I'm not in control. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> and then that affected her. Um, and, and maybe someday in the future, we can have the privilege of speaking with her in regards to her journey in aviation. And it affected her for years um, before she can come back to the line. As you can imagine, you know, knowing that you were so close to the events and to the perpetrators of the events. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Personal it, contact. <laughs> yeah. I, I can only imagine, you know, and, and hearing that I just have nothing but sympathy for her to have gone through that. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that. Uh, that's a, you know, there are those of us that have been affected. Most of us in the country can say we've been affected that we're, that we're around at the time. Uh, those of us in the industry, I think we're affected a little more so. And then there are those in the industry that paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, and, and were victims, you know, um, and, and we, we know their names and we have vowed here, or at least at Squawk Ident, to remember them always. Uh, thus the reason for this show. Uh, sure. I wanted to also ask, to ask you, you know, the events of that day affected all of us. How did it affect you and your family in the days to come? Um, I called my, I was married at the time when I called my wife, she had no clue that anything had happened. <laughs> and, uh, I said, like, you know, maybe you should turn on the TV. Um, I'm going to be stuck here in orange County for a couple of days. Um, she's like, well, what's going on? I said, well, 
couple of planes were hijacked and flown into buildings. I, and so then she had told me that um, when she got to work, you know, everybody was concerned for her because they knew that she was married to a <laughs> legacy airlines pilot and uh, that uh, she should go home. And she's like, well, he's not at home. He's stuck in Orange County. I might as well just stay here and be at work. Um, yeah. Probably the biggest thing that affected me and all of us in the industry was just career stagnation. And, you know, the airline industry imploded on itself because of all of this. And the people that worked in revenue accounting will tell you that it was already coming. Um, and it was really the internet to blame. It wasn't 9-11, but 9-11 was the straw that broke the camel's back and made it happen a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, directly after it happened, you know, I probably wasn't affected all that much um, immediately. You know, it's, it's not like I knew anyone personally uh, right away. I did eventually figure out that the captain of the uh, – United airplane that crashed in Shanksville that I had met him a couple of different times, uh, Jason Dahl. Um, he flew the same airplane that I did when I was flying uh, charters for a Cessna dealer in Fresno. And I would see his name in the Cesscom, the, the logbook that went with the aircraft. And um, I met him once or twice. And, and I saw his name flash on the TV and I called a friend of mine saying, Hey, don't we know the captain of that United flight? And uh, he's like, well, what do you mean? Who is it? And I said, Jason Dahl. And he's like, oh, my God. He says, he was the nicest guy in the world. I didn't know that was him. So that's what it says on TV when they were flashing the names of the crew on there. I just saw, the, saw that name. Yeah. And, you know, that was, you know, in the late 80s that I knew that name. And he had obviously left and gone to, you know, Brand X to fly for them. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, where he wound up and that was his fate. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it really is telling. And the more I have spent time over the past few weeks speaking with pilots that were in the industry, a lot of the captains I've flown with, they all have a very similar experience and that somehow in some way they they knew someone or knew of someone or they felt the impact of the industry you know for the long as long as back as far back as i can remember i have been saying that this is a very small industry never burn no, a bridge <laughs> you know you would think that with all the pilots in the united states and around the world that you know, sometimes you fly with someone and you'll never fly with them again. However, it's a small industry and we're all connected through our passion for aviation. And when a tragic event like this happens, somehow we're connected uh, more than just the fact that, true. We, that we fly airplanes, but the fact that we're connected through the through our community. Now, tell us a little bit about how the flying was before. 9-11. A lot of uh, young aviators today never knew an airport before TSA. I mean, there was security, but it was contract. Uh, they didn't know the experience of not just dropping off a family member on the curb, but walking them to the gate and sitting there for an hour before the flight and then watching the airplane push back and wave as your family was going on vacation or on a trip. And, That's very true. You know, what else um, can you remember about the time before security measures were? Well, you know, I remember as a kid um, that you could go, you could go to the gate without even going through screening um, before the hijacking started to happen. Um, and so, you know, and that was in the early seventies. I remember taking my dad to the airport in Stockton, and we just walked with him right to the gate. And I don't think anybody went through any kind of screening; um, they just didn't exist. Um, but before I went on an airplane, I'm pretty sure that I had to go through screening. Um, it happened because of all of the hijackings that started to happen in the early seventies. Um, but it was like you were saying, uh, contracted. Um, and I remember at orange County, um, when I came to work finally to fly the airplane on the 14th, that it was still the same screening personnel, the same people that I recognized. Cause I did a lot of flying out of orange County. It's like, 
oh, I, I know her. I, I recognize him. And I'm pretty sure it was Globe was the name of the company that provided the screening at John Wayne. And they had, you know, a maroon colored jacket that said Globe on their label there. And, and I remember thinking, how is security going to be any different today? You know, they're going to open my bag and go through everything looking for something. And it, then it wasn't any different than the day I come to work on the 10th. And I was like, Oh, well, this is kind of the same, but it didn't take long for it to change. Um, you know, within a short period of time, we had the department of Homeland security and we had uh, the TSA and it took the TSA a little while to ramp up, but, it did. And, you know, it was very different then. Um, and then the biggest thing, and, and they had done this on occasions before, but nobody was allowed to go to the gate unless you had a ticket for a flight. Yeah. Um, and in some airports, even me as a crew member, I can't go unless I'm on the NS um, as a deadheading crew member, or if I have a, um, a boarding card, a yeah. non-revenue type ticket, a boarding coupon. They won't let you in there. Um, Fresno comes to mind because that's where my folks are. And, and it's like, well, my folks are getting on this flight and I should be able to just flash my ID badge and go through screening and go. And they're like, no, if you're not getting on the plane, you're not going into the screening area. Yeah. Well, that's different. Um, so yeah, you've probably already talked about that with other people that, you know, screening is definitely different as far as who gets to go through these days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we saw many changes after the events, uh, we had, uh, like orange threat levels, yellow threat levels that lasted a few oh, years. I forgot about that. Uh, we had, yeah. uh, you know, everything from nail files to, uh, fingernail clippers that were being confisc confiscated. Um, no more Leatherman tools for the pilots. You know, a lot of pilots carried around a little pocket tool of some kind or a Swiss army knife or something that was gone. Um, I can remember them taking away my cutlery <laughs> going through uh, TSA in New York. And they're like, you can't have these. It's like, well, I got them from the first class uh, <laughs> meal that I just received on my previous flight. So if you want to compensate them, go ahead, because I'll just grab another pair. And they, they didn't like it when I said that. Um, so a lot of things have changed from the protocols that we use are, you know, all our uh, security sensitive information that we are required to, to know about the from going to the bathroom. Uh, and Hans was mentioning, uh, before nine 11, if you needed the bathroom, you would just say, all right, I'm going to go to the bathroom. Okay, go. And you know, they didn't have any swapping of, you know, flight attendants coming up and going back and forth. All that was enhanced security measures. Um, that, that's very true. The, um, the way that we go to the bathroom where the flight attendants would just come into the cockpit unannounced. They had a key to the cockpit and the door would open and they were in there. Yeah. And of course that is completely different. Um, like you were saying to go to the bathroom, you just get up and go and you had your own key and you open the cockpit door and you came back in. Um, the, um, cutlery thing, you know, I, I remember that it's like, it seemed weird to non rev in first class and you were served your meal with plastic spoon and fork and knife. And it's like, wow, plastic, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I do remember that was very specific was coming into uh, Washington, D.C. If you're going to be landing at uh, National Airport or Ronald Reagan Airport, I don't remember if it was called Reagan then, <laughs> um, you had to have a code word um, when you had to use that when you checked in with Potomac Approach. And uh, if you didn't say it, they would come back and they wouldn't say, what's your code word? They would just say, you know, flight so-and-so say again. Oh yeah. You know, so in addition <laughs> to saying the eight you would say the code word. Yeah. And then it was okay. Now we're, now we're willing to talk to you. Right. <laughs> um, I'd forgotten about that and that, that didn't go on for too long. Um, that was maybe six months of that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I definitely remember, and it's pretty much still the same way to this day is no general aviation flights are allowed into national airport. Um, you know, no business jets were allowed. Um, no Cherokees, nothing. Nobody except airlines were allowed to go into there. And occasionally I'll see a business jet parked on the ramp there, but it's probably, you know, something to do with government. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember a for change. a long time we had that whole, no one could get out of their seat for 30 minutes prior to landing. Yeah. And you know, we had to make an That's announcement. Right. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. 30 minutes prior to landing. 
the captain would have to make a PA saying, ladies and gentlemen, you have to remain in your seats from this point on. Anyone that comes out of their seat is considered a threat and, and then we'll have to hold and then get escorted. And so, yeah, it was a kind of a big deal. Um, I remember and I used to think, that's pretty strict. And why is it only there, you know, only in those airports there in the D.C. area? Um, really worried about Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, now, you know, we've we've lost so many Americans and, and people of all nations, really. O almost 3,000 people lost their lives on 9-11. Uh, we had our first responders running up the stairwells as the buildings had collapsed. Uh, we had lost flight crew members that were murdered in their seats uh, in, in an effort to use these aircraft as weapons. And this had never really happened before in this manner. And, I, and a lot of times when I speak with pilots, especially those that were flying during that time, they say it was an awful tragedy, but the nation woke up from their naivety or the naivete. Um, America was naive. The industry was naive to think that something like this couldn't happen. And it took some radicals to wake us all up. And, and we've all changed and we've all continued to look at security as a, a major step for the future in this industry, especially. Do you think that that naivete still exists in this industry? Um, not nearly to the extent that it did before. Um, it's, um, it, that's very true that, you know, America was a sleeping giant <laughs> and now, you know, we've been awoken and we're pissed off and mad and we're going to flex our might. Um, I think today, I don't think we're naive as much as we are complacent. Very well said. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, so every day, you know, the little things that we kind of do our job day in, day out, and we get kind of comfortable with it. But yeah, there are times when all of us uh, get a little complacent with our security. Just, you know, that something doesn't happen and you've, you're spring loaded, you know, for so long and then nothing happens and nothing happens and you spring loaded and then, you know, eventually you, What's the point? I know that that's how people think. And, you know, that's what the, the enemy is waiting for, is for us to be exactly like that. Yeah. So, we've all flown with the guy that, to this day, he's still spring-loaded and ready to fight the battle. Um, and God bless those people. <laughs> we all need to be more like them. Um, and then some people, you know, just aren't as, you know, cautious as they need to be. Yeah. Um, it's, it's real easy to open the cockpit door without looking through the viewfinder, but I make myself do it every time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and all it takes is what one time, uh, you know? Yeah. So yeah, we should never forget the severity of what happened that day. Part of the reason I wanted to interview so many of you wonderful aviators that were in the industry active during that time was because I wanted to ask you specifically, how can you or we express the significance of what 9-11 means to a young person who has a passion for aviation that is maybe even in the industry, even flying for a regional in their early 20s? That was just too young to understand the gravity of the events that unfolded. How can you explain to them what the significance of 9-11 is? You know, I think every generation grasps with that question when something significant happens. I'm sure that people who were around when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, you know, struggle with that. It's like, you don't understand, you weren't there. Um, you know, World War I people, you know, the Great War. It's like, you know, that generation, you don't understand, you know, what happens. So I think every generation that goes through a big event like that, you know, struggles with that question. Like, how do we, you know, make the young people who weren't there understand what happened? And it it's really um, encouraging those people to study history and to try to help them realize that something like this could happen again. And as far as, you know, how you do it. I'm, I'm probably not the right guy to ask, 
I don't really know how you make somebody understand who wasn't there other than, you know, showing them the history and encouraging them to watch the TV when specials come on because it's a, um, a 20 years and it's like, you know, Hey, you know, we should watch this together. And here's my opinion as to, uh, what happened that day. Um, and somebody who's genuinely interested and wants to learn will will watch the TV show and ask you the questions like, you know, what was happening to you that day? What was your experience? And, you know, sharing that with that person is is probably the best that you can offer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and that's really in part what we're doing here today. And I just want to say thank you for joining us, for agreeing to be on, or allowing me to, to speak with you today. I know we're both on layovers, flying out there on the flight line, and, and we should be you know, getting our rest and, and maybe having a cold one to relax and, <laughs> and start the, There's still time for that. the day fresh. Yes, <laughs> for sure. So uh, again, thank you for joining us, Dave. Uh, I absolutely appreciate it. I appreciate you. And, and good luck out there. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you uh, being interested in my story. Thank you. You're welcome.